Let's begin with a question. If you had to make one life choice right now to set yourself on the path to future health and happiness, what would it be? Would you choose to put more money into savings each month? To change careers? Would you decide to travel more? What single choice could best ensure that when you reach your final days and look back, you feel like you've lived a good life? All day long, we're bombarded with messages about what will make us happy, about what we should want in our lives, about who's doing life right. Ads tell us that eating this brand of yogurt will make us feel healthy, buying smartphones that will bring new joy to our lives, and using a special face cream that will keep us young forever. Over time, we develop the subtle but hard to shake feeling that our life is here, now, and the things we need for a good life are over there, or in the future, always just out of reach. Looking at life through this lens, it's easy to believe that the good life doesn't really exist, or that it's only possible for others. Our own life, after all, rarely matches the pictures we've created in our heads of what a good life should look like. So, what does a good life look like? Happy Vlogmas Day 15, everyone. Today, I felt like discussing the term happiness and what it means to live a good life and a happy one because I've recently found myself doing some research on the topic of happiness and it's something I wanted to share. The World Happiness Study. I first came across this when I was doing a data analysis project. It was my first Python data analysis project. And I felt like studying happiness because if we could all figure out what happiness is, the world would be a better place, right? World Happiness Report is an annual report conducted by the Gallup World Poll, which asks more than 100,000 participants questions, including their perception of corruption in their country and their freedom to make life choices. And according to this study, the most important factor to live a happy life was social support. It had the most correlation to the overall happiness score of a country, and it seemed to be pretty clear that social support equaled more happiness. Now, what I mean by social support, social support under this study meant that you have someone in your life that you can rely on, someone that you can trust, someone that you can confide in, i.e. a friend or family member. I think it's obvious why this was such an important factor in this study, because as the quote goes, we all need someone to lean on. And to go back to my usual social media argument, I think this means real life physical connections with people, people that you're meeting face to face. I think that sometimes online can give us a false sense of community, although it can be real. I think there's something way more important about a physical connection with people. And so I ask you the question, do you have people in your life that you can confide in, people that you can trust and talk to when you're feeling down? The Danish way. It's hard to be rich in Denmark, but it's also hard to be poor as they say, because Denmark has a pretty good social system, I would say, compared to most countries. They have a poverty rate at around 11-12%, which although any more than zero is a high amount, it is considerably lower than most bordering countries. And if you look at the Danes, you'll notice that they pay a lot of tax and a lot of money goes to the social well-being of others, which kind of goes against a lot of what people say about being happy. They say it's financial freedom, but reality in Denmark is that you give away a lot of your money, but you're giving it to other people who need it more than you. And in turn, you're getting a bigger sense of community of those who are living in your country. And so I think it's a really interesting point with the Danes there. So I guess what I'm saying with this is that sometimes it's more about giving than receiving. One day I was at a cafe with two of my Danish friends and they told me about the laws of Jante, which completely shook me, Yet it made me have a way bigger understanding of, I guess, Danish, but this seems to be a Scandinavian. Uh, let me just read them out for you and tell me if this is what you're expecting from a country that's supposedly the happiest in the world. Number one, you are not to think you are anything special. Number two, you are not to think you are as good as we are. Number three, you're not to think you are smarter than we are. Number seven, you're not to think that you are good at anything. 
Number 10, you're not to think that you can teach us anything. Now, on the one hand, when you first hear these laws, you might think that's a bit soul shattering because in other cultures, like I would say British and American cultures, we we're brought up as kids to hear that we're amazing and we're special and we have so much to offer to the world. And yet in Denmark and other Scandinavian countries, they're out teaching their kids in schools that it's not about you as a person, it's about the community. Don't think you're as smart as we are together. I may be believing that everyone is amazing on their own and we're all special isn't as great as we think it is now of course i believe that you should tell a kid that they can do everything they want and that they're great but i just find it interesting that in denmark they teach kids the opposite and yet the humility that kids get from this somehow leads to better happiness to believe that you're better together and again it's going back to this factor that you're better as a group you're better with people in your life than you are alone because there's so many trends going around right now which just sound like it's all about you and it's all about you being the best you not needing other people in your life and i just think it's slightly damaging information to give out to future generations because we've always needed people in our lives go back to caveman times we were always in grips if you were alone that was a bad thing and I think this still holds today that we're better together. Financial freedom. In a 2007 survey, millennials were asked about what their most important life goals were. 66% said that becoming rich was their number one goal. 50% said a major goal was to become famous. More than a decade later, after millennials had spent more time as adults, similar questions were asked again in a pair of surveys. Fame was now lower on the list, but the top goals again included things like making money, having a successful career and becoming debt free. And I want to hold on to the becoming debt free part of this because I've, I remember having a conversation with Emilia a while ago about this, but it's crazy how many things we don't own yet we pay money towards and i'm not just talking about mortgages i'm talking about your phone bill i'm talking about when you buy an item in free with like Klarna or what we've developed this culture where you're always renting things like you're renting your netflix subscription you used to buy a dvd and that physical dvd was yours but now you're renting a month's worth of watching content and i think there's something sad about the fact that we don't own things anymore. When I look back at my grandparents, they of course had a mortgage, but when they paid it off, that house was theirs and that house was theirs for over 50 years. I think it feels greater when you own things. And that's easier said than done because, well, our generation has basically been told that we can't afford things, so we have to rent things. I just find that when I'm able to buy something, I appreciate it much more. Back to the other side of financial freedom, there are a lot of studies that kind of contrast whether financial freedom actually equals happiness. There's a famous one in 2007 that an American household needed around $75,000 of annual income to ha reach the, the happiness peak before it eventually just plateaued or became stagnant. However, this study has later been updated and people say that it's now considerably a lot more money, around a half million per year, just to for that same level of happiness that people did back then. And so maybe there is something to money because with money you can buy things. But I also just want to put out the other side of the argument, if I may, that you'll reach a certain amount of money and then you'll want more. You'll have that certain amount of money and you'll buy things and you'll just want more things because we're trained to believe that more is always better. And I made a video about this, so you can check it out if you want. But I just want to put out the preposition that perhaps sometimes just appreciating the things you have could lead you to a happier life. Now, I know I'm treading on thin ice when it comes to money because it's such a difficult topic for most people. So I'll leave it there. Purpose. Now, as I'm in a period of my life where I cannot have a big purpose, pieces, I'm really understanding how much having a purpose in life can make you feel happier. Having something to wake up every morning, even if it is a more mundane job. I remember when I worked in a fashion store and I would be waking up early and I go, oh, I don't like waking up today i don't feel like going to the work i always felt a good sense of accomplishment when i came home i, w I woke up i did an honest day's work i came home and right now that i don't have that i'm missing that part of my life and so i really do believe that purpose is a big factor in happiness and inversely i think putting too much pressure on your life's purpose can lead to a slippery slope not to get into albert camus absurdism and the idea that there is no purpose in life <laughs> but i think if we put too much pressure onto it what our life purpose is it's just gonna do the inverse of making you happy and i think it could just be something something as simple as waking up every day 
to go to work, coming home, making a good meal, seeing people and going to bed. I think that can be your life's purpose. I don't think everyone has to be an inventor. I don't think everyone has to win a Nobel Peace Prize to feel purpose in their life. I think it can be the simple things like contributing to a community. Okay, thank you so much for watching today's video. I know this was a bit of a random one, but I hope you enjoyed either way and I'll see you tomorrow for Vlogmas Day 16. Bye.